Hello everyone and welcome to Health Analytics Asia. On the first day of 2021, nearly half a million people were infected with COVID-19 and about 10,000 lost their lives. But as the pandemic still rages on, the new year brought with it hope. The world was eagerly waiting for a vaccine. We now have several. About eight of them are presently in use across 40 different countries. India too has approved two vaccines for emergency public rollout a process which we expect to begin on January the 16th. But as that process unfolds, we sure want to seek some answers first. Answers to questions about the vaccines, the approvals, their approval processes, the data, and so on. To help us do that, and to understand all the yin and yang of India's approved vaccines, we have with us Dr. Shahid Jamil, India's top virologist, and presently director of the Trivedi School of Biosciences at Ashoka University. He has been one of the leading voices during the pandemic. Dr. Jamil, thank you so much for joining us and we welcome you. I want to start off with, uh, with a question on India's COVID scenario. Some states in India have seen multiple wave of infections. In Delhi, for example, has seen three. Many states haven't. Do you think India has avoided a second wave as a nation? Well, uh, I think India's first wave, so to say, was quite, quite broad. Uh, the peak was not very sharp. Uh, so as a result of that, I think broadly India may not have what we traditionally call a second wave. Uh, this is entirely my hypothesis. I have no proof for it. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, if you look at the number of people in India who might be exposed to the virus, who may be infected uh, with the virus already. That number based on different zero surveys, both done by ICMR, not the National Zero Surveys, as well as uh, zero surveys uh, in different cities. And uh, some uh, testing done by uh, companies that do blood testing in the private domain. Uh, if you look at all that data uh, and try to make some sense out of it, it appears that India may already have somewhere in the range of 300 to 400 million infected people. And uh, if that is the case, then certainly a lot of the population has already uh, been infected and they would have some level of immunity and that would protect others uh, uh, from getting uh, infected. So a big wave uh, may not be there. Uh, there are models also, epidemiological models, uh, that uh, predict somewhere around 30% of India's population on average uh, to have been infected. So this tallies quite nicely with the numbers that I'm telling you. And in fact, uh, in densely populated cities, uh, these models talk about even 50% of people uh, having been in, uh, infected. So if all that is true, then uh, I think that explains quite nicely why India on the whole may not have uh, a second wave. The other point to consider is that uh, our festive season, meaning the Sarah and Diwali, and the period between the Sarah and Diwali, which is typically a season where a lot of people go out in markets. And, uh, that, and in that period, we also had Bihar elections. Uh, and you would have seen pictures of uh, election rallies where there was hardly anyone wearing a mask. Uh, and if you have looked at markets in major cities, uh, mask use not was, very, was not very prevalent. Despite that, uh, we didn't really see a big spike in cases uh, after the festive season. There was a little blip uh, that came around 15th of November, you know, around mid-November. But beyond that, uh, we didn't really see much. Uh, so I think all of this put together sort of suggests that India is unlikely to have traditionally what is called a second wave. But there will be little spikes here and there locally, uh, right. but they would not contribute to, you know, like a major spike. 
so with uh, with with what you said the country more or less may not see a second wave and the fact that we may see vaccines coming in uh, is it safe to say that we as a country are more or less out of the woods so to speak the worst is over maybe well i i hate to put it like that because the moment you put it like that people become relax and become complacent and experts are almost always proven wrong by by diseases uh, so i would not say that i would say that yes uh, the worst may be over but we're certainly not out of the woods uh, and my advice would be for people to continue to uh, maintain precautions even after we get a vaccine uh, it's very important for us to continue to wear masks uh, and the reason for that is that the end point of vaccine testing has been efficacy against disease no vaccine claims that it will stop transmission so while i may get a vaccine uh, i may still get infected and not produce disease uh, and if i get infected i will be spreading virus to others so i think it would be terribly selfish of me to get a vaccine then and then roam around potentially uh, being a spreader right so my suggestion would be that even after getting a vaccine uh, we should continue to to wear masks to maintain the same level of precautions that we are right now absolutely uh, absolutely topic talking about vaccines now we have uh, two vaccines approved now what is your opinion on both the vaccines we have the covid shield the oxford vaccine coming in india as covid shield and the other one the bharat biotech uh, as covaxin what is your opinion about the vaccines well i mean my opinion let me just say that my opinion is simply my opinion uh, science doesn't work on my opinion or your opinion or beliefs science works on evidence and evidence comes from data right so instead of saying what i believe i would rather rely on science and the simple reason is that vaccines are a product of science vaccines are not a product of what i believe or you believe right uh, and therefore we must uh, be very mindful of data and we must be very critical of data and the data says that uh, the serum institute vaccine has uh, ha- has some efficacy value although that efficacy was not determined through trials in india and even that efficacy is under some cloud simply because the data from uk and brazil looked very different from each other uh in brazil uh they found 62% efficacy in the uk trials they found 90% efficacy and then they realized that in the uk trial uh there was an error and the first dose was actually only half dose uh so i have uh, an objection to combining data from brazil and uk uh and combine to say that my efficacy is 70.4% Mm-hmm. i i think the data was so different and the trial uh, was different because the dosing was different so i don't think that combination can be made nevertheless uh even if the efficacy was let's say 62% there is an efficacy value that we know mm-hmm. uh in case of the bharat biotech covaxin we don't even know the efficacy value right uh, that vaccine was only being tested in india the phase 3 trials are ongoing uh, we are not very clear whether everyone in the trial has been vaccinated with two doses or not so the data is is just not available uh, uh, so that's my view on it uh, i think uh, for both vaccines uh, uh, data is uh, is limited uh, and i would honestly personally like to see more data so like you pointed out there is something ms in both the vaccines that are being rolled out in india so a lot of questions of course are being are, are, are being raised uh, uh, questions about rushed approvals and missing data of course and the fact that covaxin is still in its third phase as the layman as the common man on the street should they should the common man really be worried or is is it uh, is it made out to be more than what it actually is well uh 
in a sense, the common man shouldn't be worried at this point, simply because the common man is not getting the vaccine at this point. Right. Uh, remember, Government of India's vaccination plan is to first vaccinate uh, one crore healthcare workers and then two crore frontline workers. Maybe they will, these two will go on in parallel. Mm -hmm. And only after we are done with the three crore, uh, then the rollout will begin for the other 27 crore. Uh, who constitute people above 50 years of age mm -hmm. and those below 50 with comorbidities. So I think by the time that happens, uh, we will have efficacy data for both vaccines from India. Uh, and I truly believe that both these vaccines will give us reasonably good efficacy data. Uh, but that's simply my belief, as I said earlier, doesn't work on uh, the base. I have to wait. I have to wait to see the data. Right. Yeah. So, uh, with these with these things happening, what do you think are the top challenges India would face now in mass vaccinating? Because now there is a question of maintaining or perhaps even rebuilding public trust in vaccines, uh, and even in public health programs in general. Is there is it is it an even more difficult task now, or what is India's top challenge right now? Well, I mean, India faces a couple of challenges. Uh, the first challenge is going to be delivering this vaccine to uh, you know 30 million people uh, very quickly and then uh, another 270 million uh, you know over over the year priority group over the year uh, and i believe the government has made good preparations for it uh, there is a plan in place uh, which is nice uh, uh, there have also been dry runs, uh, which is good. So you know where problems might happen. Uh, so the intent is right. Uh, yes, you may you may do dry runs, but you know when the actual rollout happens, you may find, you know, some other problems will happen. I mean, Murphy's law talks about, uh, you know, if if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Uh, but I think the intent is good, and uh, the plan. Uh, to give it to priority groups and the plan to do these dry runs has been uh, really uh, a good plan. Now, as far as uh, you know, building trust, uh, I think trust is, is a key uh, to controlling disease and especially controlling pandemics. Uh, trust is also important for people to be uh, mindful of what a vaccine can offer and what a vaccine can't offer. And I think the best way of uh, securing trust is to be completely transparent uh, and uh, you know, make sure that all the data is available uh, openly. You know, science, uh, people who don't do science, to them science uh, appears to be like magic that you know, science has, a, has an answer for everything. Science doesn't always have an answer for everything. Science also goes wrong. What we may have proof for today may be proven wrong tomorrow. And I think the, uh, the best attribute of science is that uh, scientists don't believe in the absolute truth. What is, what is true today, uh, may be proven wrong tomorrow. So I think people have to understand this, this process of doing science uh, and how science provides evidence-based solutions. So I think it's, it's very, very important to, for people to understand this and uh, for the scientists, scientific community, for the government to emphasize on this, that yes, we may not have answers for everything, but if you do a risk benefit analysis, it will be useful for you to take a vaccine. Uh, now, if, if the cost of, and I'm not talking about cost as, as price in monetary value, if the cost of me getting infected to me is lower than the cost of getting a vaccine, then I wouldn't care about getting a vaccine. But 
if I understand that, uh, you know, if I take a vaccine, it will cut down drastically my chances of getting infected and the other uh, problems that happen along with the infection, then I will go ahead and take a vaccine. So I think instead of, instead of uh, telling people that science has all the solutions, uh, it's important to tell the truth and be honest and be upfront and be transparent. That will build trust. Uh, one other point. thing I will say, yeah, no, so one other thing I will say is that in respect to these two vaccines that are uh, under, uh, you know, sort of uh, under a lot of scrutiny these days, uh, the single biggest damage to the reputation of both of these vaccines have come from the vaccine companies themselves. You know, uh, their, their CEOs started trashing each other on public, on, you know, in public on, on national television. I mean, one, one says that, you know, their vaccine is just like water, it doesn't work. You know, the other turns around and says, well, they were mixing paracetamol or whatever. You know, people don't understand these differences. Uh, these two gentlemen should have had some sense and not started uh, their corporate wars on uh, national television. Yes, they made up uh, a day later, uh, and issued a joint statement. But in my view, the damage is done. And if there is one thing that has eroded public trust, uh, it is this act of the two vaccine companies. Touching upon the point of uh, transparency and making things clear in the process of science, uh, uh, the subject experts committee, uh, it, it had it had its meeting over a period of three days during which uh, proposals and presentations were made by both the vaccine companies. And across these meetings came the decisions for, for approvals. Uh, as an expert, are you satisfied with the, the, the process that was taken uh, in, in, you know, uh, for, for, for give, granting these approvals over those three meetings? Well, all I know is that the subject expert committee met for three days. So apparently they spent a lot of time discussing this matter, but what data was presented to them? What was the discussion that happened? I'm not privy to that. So it would be, be wrong for me to, to say whether what they did was right or wrong. Uh, you know, I don't even know who the members of that committee are. Uh, and uh, you know, if there is a committee that is, deciding whether I should get a vaccine or not, the least that should happen is that the, you know, I should know who the members of that committee are. You know, they should, the, the name should be public. Why is there such secrecy around the members of the SEC? I, you know, it's, this, this information is not in public domain. Uh, look at what US FDA did when the, uh, when the US president was putting pressure on US FDA to approve the vaccine quickly, US FDA had an, held an open meeting. The meeting was open to anyone to attend online. And all the deliberations, everything which was said is a matter of public record. That builds trust. That sort of transparency builds trust. You can't build trust by, you know, just looking at a black box and saying, okay, something went in, something came out, what happened in between, I don't know. So honestly, I don't know what happened in those meetings. So how can I even comment whether, you know, their decision was right or wrong? Understood. Uh, so yeah, sticking to vaccines and of course the two vaccines that have been approved. Uh, the, the fundamental, the platform by, uh, of the two vaccines, the, the technology, or let's say the, the process, Bharat Biotech's vaccine is, the, uh, is, is a whole variant type vaccine, while Covishield is a recombinant viral vector, the two different types. For people receiving these shots, uh, is this different something to think about? Or, or can you just break this down into, uh, into common terms for, for, uh, for our viewers? 
Well, I think people who have to take the vaccine don't have to worry about the differences in these vaccines. Uh, people have to only worry about how safe the vaccine is and how efficacious or how effective the vaccine is. But let me uh, break down what these two vaccines are all about. The whole virus vaccine is a very time-tested platform. This has been, this type of vaccines have been made for over 70, 80 years. Uh, the, the first uh, polio vaccine which was made in the 1950s uh, was an inactivated uh, viral vaccine. Uh, and you know, subsequently the oral polio vaccine came but initially the injectable polio was uh, like, you know, was a killed virus vaccine. So in a killed virus vaccine, what you do is you take the virus, you grow the virus up in culture uh, in very large amounts, you purify the virus away from uh, the cell debris, you inactivate the virus using a chemical and then this inactivated virus is mixed with uh, some substances that are called adjuvants that uh, enhance their, uh, their immune uh, capability and you give it. Uh, the advantage of these vaccines is that uh, since there is no live virus, these are safe vaccines. Uh, the other is that it includes all the components of the virus. So a virus is made up of different proteins. So it contains all the proteins. So you raise a very broad response instead of response to only one protein. Right. Uh, and multiple vaccines in use today use this platform. Bharat Biotech itself has a lot of experience making these vaccines. It has made similar vaccines for a couple of other diseases. Uh, so the company has a lot of experience with this platform and they have, they have used it extensively. Now coming to the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the one that Serum Institute is making, that's uh, a viral vector vaccine, which uses a virus, which is called the chimpanzee adenovirus. And adenovirus is a virus that causes the common cold. There are human adenoviruses and there are other animal adenoviruses also. Uh, and the one used here is a chimpanzee adenovirus because chimps are evolutionarily very close to humans. Uh, that is one reason why such a vector has been used. We have, you know, there are other vaccines that are using human adenoviruses also. But since humans keep getting infected with this virus, uh, the efficacy of uh, human adenovirus vector-based vaccines would be, uh, would be less uh, because humans would already have immunity to human adenoviruses. So the chimp adenovirus is simply used to deliver the gene for the spike protein into our cells. Right. And then that gene, uh, you know, expresses, produces the spike protein and develop uh, uh, antibody responses. So in case of the viral vector vaccine, we would only produce response against the spike protein. Whereas in the whole virus inactivated vaccine, we would also produce uh, immune response to various other proteins uh, of the virus. So that's the basic difference between the two. Okay, I want to talk about uh, a little more about the uh, the subject experts committees meetings and the lack of information, uh, so to speak, that we have uh, from the the documents that are that are public. The SSC recommendations have repeatedly mentioned Bharat Biotech's lack of efficacy data across the three days, uh, and it seems that only upon their claims of being more effective against potentially new strains of the virus that emergency use was authorized. What, are the, what is the concept behind the claims, uh, these claims made by Bharat Biotech? And how substantial are these claims? Well, I think what uh, the committee may have considered is that since the Bharat Biotech vaccine is a whole virus vaccine, 
people who get vaccinated with it will also raise immune responses to other proteins other than the spike protein. And their logic would have been that since mutations are being seen in the spike protein, uh, you know, responses against other uh, proteins would also protect against variants. But I think this is flawed reasoning, if that was their reasoning. Uh, simply because uh, there is no evidence at this time whether the new variants that have emerged will escape existing vaccines. In fact, there is some evidence to the contrary that uh, current vaccines will also protect against the new variants. Uh, so if that was the reasoning, I don't really buy that reasoning. Uh, the second is that uh, the only other protein against which you will make antibodies in the Bharat Biotech vaccine is a protein called the nucleocapsid protein, which is present inside the virus. It is not on the surface of the virus, it's inside the virus. And, you know, antibodies to a nucleocapsid protein will not neutralize the virus simply because this protein is not present on the surface and antibodies cannot enter inside the virus. Okay. Uh, it will also, these antibodies will also not neutralize uh, viruses that are infecting us because those viruses only produce the nucleocapsid protein inside cells and antibodies cannot enter cells. So having antibodies to the nucleocapsid offers no protection against anything. Okay. Okay. Uh, so from a vaccine point of view, I don't think it gives any advantage. Uh, so I really, if that is the reason to approve the uh, Bharat Biotech vaccine, I think it's a scientifically flawed reasoning. Okay, so, uh, moving on to the, the, the other vaccine that was being uh, approved, the Covishield. The Co Covishield is the Oxford vaccine in India. That's how it's being presented. That's how it's being, it's being marketed. But the trial registrations on CTRI suggest something different. Uh, SII Serum Institute actually, in fact, mentions uh, Oxford vaccine differently in the trial registrations, and it's actually used as a comparator agent and to, you, to, to compare the Covishield against. Uh, what does this mean? How, how, how is one vaccine, uh, how does, this one, how does uh, one vaccine have two different versions? No, oh, it's the same vaccine. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is mm -hmm. the same vaccine. It's just that Serum Institute is manufacturing it here in India, in Pune. Okay. But the seed stock, the seed stock for the vaccine came from AstraZeneca. Uh, it's just that, you know, the, the vaccine that AstraZeneca did trials with in UK and Brazil and South Africa was made by AstraZeneca. The, the vaccine that went into trial in India was manufactured by Serum Institute. Essentially, it's, it's just a different same, of manufacturers. Uh, That's pretty it's, much it's it. Different manufacturers. But yeah, it's the, the seed is the same. The vaccine is the same. Okay. It's no different. Some questions are being asked about the speed of trials and uh, because COVID shields, for example, uh, the phase three trials were registered for a duration of seven months and data was available within a period of four months by the end of December. Co-vaccine trial durations uh, were supposed to last even further down in time. How are trials happening so far? So are you happy with the speed of trials? Well, uh, the time that you're mentioning is the time after the two doses have gone in, there's an extended period of time for which you look for adverse events. So that's the entire trial period. Uh, I think trials have been done properly. Uh, they have, the, the most important thing to see in the trial is whether it has proper inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I am, I am sure that those have been followed. The other is the whether the time duration between the first injection and the second injection has been followed. And I think that has been followed. Uh, as it says, you know, you'll get uh, after 28 days or, you know, four weeks, you'll get the second injection. That's been fine. Uh, 
right uh see indian drug regulatory act does not have any emergency use approval but the drug controller of india has the authority to do accelerated approval uh if you look at the us fda and the european medicine agency guidelines on emergency use approval they say that emergency use approval will be given only 2 months after the second injection or only 2 months after the vaccination is complete right okay. european medicine agency puts that number as 70 days so little you know 10 days more than more than 2 months uh and there is a scientific reason for why 60 days or 70 days the scientific reason is that any uh adverse events that you see uh will come within 6 weeks and therefore you want to wait 2 months before you get give any emergency use approval because what is paramount is that a vaccine should be safe the vaccine may not provide may not have high efficacy and may not provide uh you know protection but at least vaccine should not be harmful mm-hmm. remember vaccine is given to healthy people as opposed to drugs that are given to people who are sick so safety is very important and that's why this two month period so i think the part of the problem that's happening is that uh, is whether both of these companies have completed the two month after the second injection and whether enough period has elapsed after both injections to assess the safety of uh, the vaccines i mean one one keeps talking about efficacy efficacy uh, and uh, you know what i've i keep hearing from uh, some some senior people who should know this is that uh, well so many people have gone through the first injection but the point is not the first injection often reactogenicity of vaccines is more pronounced after the second, second injection, injection than after the first injection so have two months elapsed or at least six weeks elapsed between the second injection and the data that was presented to the committee i think that's a very that's a key question and i don't know the answer to that because i haven't uh, i mean i don't have the data available to me but that's that's a key question the question keeps coming to data and uh, more importantly the lack of data uh, in all circumstances though uh but talking about uh, yeah uh, the, tri- the selection of trial groups like you said it's one of the most important things uh, it, during the trials and the words that are being used in vaccine approvals especially in uh, in covaxin's case is is uh, granting it approval in clinical trial mode so does that imply m- making the whole population that's been given uh, as a part of the rollout process is everyone under trial or is, are we all guinea pigs you know to sound a pessimist though but is that how it is well uh yeah this this word uh, approval in clinical trial mode is an invention of the subject expert committee and dcgi uh, no vaccines are given approval in clinical trial mode uh, and that is what initially created a lot of confusion till it was clarified what they actually meant by this see when you talk about clinical trial mode clinical trial mode also uh, suggest that whoever gets the vaccine will be split into two groups one group will get placebo the other group will get vaccine so the initial confusion was would people be divided into two groups and half of them will not get anything the other half will get the vaccine they clarified that's not the case everyone will get the vaccine so it's like an open trial now it's not a it's not a blinded trial it's an open trial this the second confusion was that you know every trial has an exclusion criteria the exclusion criteria for covaxin is that anyone who has prior uh, exposure to covid 
will not will be excluded from the trial anyone who has evidence of uh, hiv infection or hepatitis b or hepatitis c infection will be excluded from the trial anybody who lives in the same house as a person exposed uh, by the covid virus will be excluded from the trial so the second confusion that arose is how uh, will people be excluded would anyone who get the vaccine first gets tested for covid and for hiv and hepatitis b and hepatitis c mm -hmm. or it will just be given later it became clear that uh, exclusion criteria will not be followed okay because you know it it adds to the logistics it adds to the cost and everything third confusion that happened is that everyone who is in a clinical trial is covered by a health insurance and insurance against uh, injury from the vaccine would anyone who get the vaccine in clinical trial mode also be covered by insurance It, this was not clear at all right. so these were the points of confusion and and later it was clarified that all they meant by clinical trial mode was that people who will get this vaccine will be followed very closely so they will have to report every two weeks whether they have any adverse effects and you know they would have access to uh, hospitals where they can go and get treated if they have any problems so uh, i think it's the language that made it uh, it very confusing uh, and uh, the dcgi when he made this uh, this press conference didn't take any questions uh, it would have been far better to take questions and clarify these issues then and there instead of uh, you know people just wondering for a few days and then the clarification comes yeah yeah uh, of course now uh, initially being uh, i mentioned that there are of course many many vaccines are being rolled out uh, pfizer and moderna have uh, that's how it started in the us uh, the point being that given that multiple vaccines are being approved there of different platforms in different manners of course the approvals come and for any potential recipient should it be the choice of that person as to which vaccine they get or should it just be a government decision do you not think it should be a choice of choice of the recipient now well it depends uh, who is getting vaccinated and when they are getting vaccinated let's let's take the case of india uh if you fall within the uh 30 million people 3 3 crore people who are healthcare workers or frontline workers the government is going to be giving you this vaccine free right so uh the government will give you the vaccine that the government is able to procure uh to give it to to give it free and of course the government is 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 responsible and the government is not going to procure something that is uh, unsafe or worthless the government is going to procure something that is uh, both safe and effective uh so there you won't have a choice as to which vaccine you get your choice may be to say i don't want this vaccine and i think that choice must be people should be able to exercise that choice that just because you are a healthcare worker or a front frontline worker uh it should not be made mandatory uh, but with the understanding that if you are a healthcare worker and a frontline worker a you are at much increased risk of infection and disease therefore it is in your interest to take the vaccine and secondly uh you know if you get infected in your own workplace setting then you will be taking the infection home and you will be spreading it in your home in your community right so i think the res responsible thing to do for healthcare workers and frontline workers would be to go take the vaccine but people should be educated and convinced to take the vaccine instead of making the vaccine mandatory uh, because the moment you would make it mandatory it raises all kinds of other questions yeah. however if we are talking about uh, let's say 
towards the end of this year or maybe next year when vaccines might be available uh, either through the government distribution system or in the open market, then of course it's your choice. Then the market economics will decide. Uh, if you have the money to go and get a Moderna vaccine from, from a chemist shop and, and get yourself vaccinated, you will do that. If you want to still get uh, the uh, Serum Institute or Bharat Biotech vaccine at 200 rupees a dose through the government system, you will go and get that. Do you see that open yeah. market system? Do you see that happening in India? Uh, vaccines eventually coming I think into eventually, the open market? I think eventually it will happen. It will have to be a public-private partnership. I don't think the government can afford to uh, vaccinate uh, everyone who needs to be vaccinated uh, uh, free of cost. So, so let's it say have to be at some point. Perhaps yeah. in 2022, the young and the healthy might have to walk to the chemist shop, get a vaccine of their choice and get it jabbed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think that will happen even with the 27 crore people who are priority. The government has not said that it's going to make vaccines freely available to this group. The government has so far only said that vaccines will be freely available to the three crore people on priority. So for the 27 crore, you will yourself see a public-private distribution oh, model. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, on a more uh, broader sense, in the world, of course, is now, we're now moving to the next stage of the pandemic with uh, you know, global vaccine rollouts. Uh, taking a step back, per se, as uh, what are the lessons that you think we've learned uh, in, in, in public health programs as well as vaccine development? Because this, this whole pandemic has been and pro probably will continue to be uh, very challenging and different. So there are of course lessons for public health and uh, vaccine development programs. What are the top lessons that you think we have uh, learned? As a country or as humanity? Let's say both. Okay. Well, uh, as humanity, I think the top lesson is that uh, science is, has been able to defeat this pandemic. So believe in science, believe in facts. Uh, don't believe in all the nonsense, all the other chatter that you hear. Uh, and it, there, is, there is a need to strengthen both science and the scientific process and for people to, to understand uh, what it's all about. Uh, it's, the, it's the doctors and the scientists who have really gotten us out of this mess. Uh, remember when the pandemic started, the mortality rate was somewhere around nine or 10%. Globally, I'm talking about. Today, the global mortality rate on average is about two and a half percent. The virus is the same, the virus hasn't changed. What has changed is that we have learned how to, uh, how to deal with it, how to treat in clinics, in hospitals. Doctors are sharing information and they are the real heroes uh, of this. Information is being made publicly available in real time and that is what has made the difference. People are sharing clinical protocols, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, that is what is saving lives. So I think it's very important for information to be available openly uh, and for us to believe uh, in the method of science. Uh, as a country, I would say the same thing, uh, that trust uh, in science, but also that we need to strengthen our public health system. Uh, down to the primary health care centers. Uh, and, you know, it is, it is uh, the primary health care centers that are the first ones to look at infection and disease and catch it uh, before it becomes too big. So I think that needs to be, uh, to be strengthened uh, a lot. And so uh, sorry. The third, the third lesson I would say globally is that uh, you know viruses will keep emerging, 
this is not the last one to have emerged mm -hmm. how are we preparing ourselves for the next one so there are certain you know positives that have come through in covid times and to my mind the biggest positive is the speed at which vaccines have been developed and certainly these are uh, mrna technologies uh, which are turning out to be uh, really quite successful this is the future of vaccinology uh, you know remember the moderna vaccine uh, went from sequence to trial in 42 days and trial started from sequence to start of trial was 63 days so we have the capacity to cut it down can we cut it down to maybe 15 days a week if we are able to do that and we are able to have a large distributed system of making vaccines then we will be able to control future outbreaks uh, before they they cause uh, uh, too much uh, death and destruction and the second thing is we have to address the root cause of these uh, outbreaks and the emergence of uh, of pandemic viruses the root cause is how we are playing with our environment uh, you know all of these viruses are jumping from animals into humans from wild animals into humans we have to limit the interface between wild animals and humans which means that we have to stop cutting down forests i mean we are all talking about vaccines vaccines but you know go back and see how it came by it didn't come from, uh, well, I mean, it did come from a wet uh, market uh, in China, but where did it come from the wet market? It came from the forest. Right. Uh, so let us stop the destruction of our environment. That's the root cause of, of all this. Interesting. Yeah, science uh, has defeated the pandemic, uh, pandemic but it's, uh, it's, there's only so much science can do and unless we, of course, stop uh, our own, change our own habits. Uh, talking about, uh, yeah, on the same point of science and research, of course, COVID-19 research has been, has been unprecedented, vaccine development, like you mentioned. Uh, how do you see this influencing existing, pan existing health problems, for example, HIV or, or, uh, or hep hepatitis B health problems? Does any of this research, do you see, how do you see this translating into solving those problems? Well, uh, possibly directly, no, but uh, every disease, every infection will learn some lessons. Uh, and I, I think one lesson that we have learned is how important it is in disease research to share knowledge openly. Uh, so if we take this lesson uh, for other diseases also, and uh, you know, the, the funny thing is that uh, Research is largely funded by taxpayer money through national grants all over the world. Research is done by people who get their salaries from public money, largely. Uh, research papers are reviewed by people who get no compensation for reviewing papers. But Publishing companies charge you and me to read those papers. So I think, you know, there has to be open uh, exchange of information. It's a, it's a very funny model. Uh, that's, you know, nowhere you will see this, this kind of model that, uh, you know, the research is, is done using some, you know, taxpayer money Research is done by the researcher who pay, who is paid by the taxpayer. Reviewers review uh, projects and, uh, and papers without any compensation. And who makes the money? Publishers. You know, this has to stop. This is a completely wrong model. Uh, and if there's one thing that we have learned through this pandemic is that open access to information is crucial. In uh, in dealing with disasters, COVID research. Uh, I mean, it, it has it has been a policy of of some sort that 
open knowledge sharing has been one of the one of the hallmarks of of this pandemic it's of course so uh, right i mean covid research all research was open access of course exactly so do you see do you advocate all that happening journals that were, yeah all the journals that hide their other research behind paywalls made covid research open access and right. that's why you see you know such fast progress in vaccine development in in treatment protocols everything Like that's interesting because then uh, this basically what happened during pandemic uh, solved the 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 uh, funny element in the model that you just mentioned because if it if it's uh, a free transfer of knowledge it, it completes the whole system the way it probably should be in some sense. So yeah, just to wrap things up, uh, as a virologist, as uh, yeah, as one of the leading voices during the whole pandemic, what has been your biggest uh, learning during this uh, during twenty twenty and uh, during the whole pandemic? well uh i think there are time tested ways to protect ourselves protect each other uh and we must continue to do that while we continue to trust science in we continue to trust uh people at the front line i think each of us have a responsibility uh each of us are responsible for limiting transmission of the virus and if you limit transmission of the virus you also limit mutations in the virus so it's no surprise that viral mutants are emerging uh in places like uh, like uk and uh, south, south africa, africa and other places where people are running around wearing without wearing masks they are you know transmitting it all over i mean i'm not saying that uh, in india everything is 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 fine uh you know we may also have a variant independently developed in india that we don't know about it's very much possible right but i think each one of us as citizens of the world owe responsibility to each other to society governments can only do so much we want the government to do everything but we take no personal responsibility at least we can wear a mask at least we can you know don't avoid crowded places why are we not doing that you know and you know we should from a government point of view the government should make policy which makes us easy to do that uh i i do understand that for somebody who doesn't know where the next meal is coming from wearing a mask is not going to be his topmost priority that's where the government can help right but all of us also owe a personal responsibility and to me i think that's the biggest lesson that's the biggest learning uh and also uh, a lot of gratitude to all the people who really work day and night uh to to ensure that everyone else is safe uh, our doctors our healthcare workers uh you know security forces uh, sanitation workers everyone big gratitude to all of them uh for uh, for what they have done that's pretty much what uh, i had in mind to ask you uh, dr jamil and thank you so much for joining us uh, thank you so much for taking out the time and answering the critical questions